All right, I'd like to welcome everybody again to our um, progress and planning event. Today we are talking about urban agriculture and we're really fortunate to have three excellent speakers with us. Um, to start, we have Alexandra Payne who graduated from RUPS in 2010. Uh, she's an urban planner and policy consultant at Amplify Planning in Brooklyn in New York, and she provides strategic development and project management services to improve food access in urban agriculture, neighborhood development initiatives in cities. Um, she's going to be speaking about the role networks can play um, largely in supporting urban agriculture. And it's also worth saying that she's got her fingers in a lot of pies. Uh, she's also doing a project with some friends in New York called Illuminate, which is a public art um, event that is uh, installation that is looking at uh, visualizations of COVID-19 um, and how that affected and impacted New York. So I would highly recommend you to look at that. If you're curious about it, it's on her blog on the website. Um, and then we also have Tom Henderson, who's the program manager at Smarter UK. Uh, he's an expert in digital innovation in smart cities, climate risk and resilience. And he's gonna be talking to us today about the role digital technology can play in urban agriculture. And finally, we're very lucky to have with us um, Sarah Williams, who is gonna be, uh, she's the program um, director at Sustain and she's part of the capital growth team and they've supported over 2000 community food growing spaces in London. And she's gonna be talking about what role policy might play in supporting the growth of our, the urban agricultural movement. So as in our last event, we'll have short presentations, 10 minutes each and um, from our speakers. And then we're gonna open the floor to all of you to ask questions and you can do so in the chat. Uh, so, in order not to take up too much time, I'm going to pass the floor over to Alex. Perfect. Um, and you guys let me know uh, if this works out. Let's see if I can get my slide up. So uh, as Nancy mentioned, I've been working kind of in food security, a little bit in more national level food policy, looking at sustainable diets and then also lots of urban agriculture for about the last 15 years now. And so today I really wanted to kind of touch on this topic of how urban agricultural spaces as institutions are really ideally placed not only to address um, local food security issues, uh, but also because of the types of networks that they develop, they're really well placed in a crisis uh, like the current pandemic um, to be able to address these sort of food security and food access issues that come up. And then also um, in this sort of longer term development of stronger regional supply chains and real regional resiliency when we're starting to look at things um, like addressing climate change and the harms that have been caused over time um, by our more industrialized forms of agriculture. So let's see if this works. So little quick background. Um, I have a farm in Newark, New Jersey. It was formed by the Planting Seeds of Hope Network. It's called Swag Project, which is like a really long name for the South Ward Agrigarden. Uh, and our kids renamed it because they wanted something cheekier. So we started in 2010. We started with one growing space that was about a fourth of an acre. We now have two contiguous farms that are half an acre. Uh, in the beginning, we were there to really try and develop community cohesion in an area of Newark that's incredibly cut off, uh, just like a lot of other places in the New York region uh, and in the North in the US highways in the 60s and 70s, really cut a lot of people off from city centers. And then deinvestment meant that they lost a lot of the resources in their community, especially food. So we started as a youth education, community engagement and food access project. Uh, and our real goal was to tie ourselves to a lot of other local institutions to build trust. Our other goal was to start uh, increasing our food provision on site for the local area. The area is, I guess, what we would call today a food desert, maybe more accurately a food swamp. So there is access to a lot of fast foods in the area, but there's not a lot of access to healthy foods. And again, because it's so cut off um, from other parts of the city, 
transit to get to healthy foods is really difficult and often non-existent. Um, in our first couple of years, we started a community market on site, and another of our really big tenets was to grow a network kind of similar to the work that Capital Growth was doing of farmers in the hyper local urban area and then bridging out into other parts of Newark to encourage other people to start farms and then helping them to start those farms. Um, that's just a little bit of background uh, of how I come to a lot of my ideas and my understanding of urban farms as institutions. And so if I'm thinking about their role in network development um, and in providing aid to urban areas, especially in a crisis. Obviously, one of the biggest things that they can be is these sort of centers for local food security and production sites. So as I mentioned, we started growing a thousand pounds of food a year. We eventually ended up growing about 5,000 pounds by being able to intensify what we were doing. And now we have a larger local network that allows us to provide something more around the tune of 25,000 pounds of hyperlocal food. We do have quite a few very small farms that we're partnered with and also a larger regional context where we're pulling in from some sort of peri-urban farms um, and people further north of us and south of us. Um, so we've been able to aggregate a lot of hyperlocal food to the point where we're able to actually supplement um, mainstream food provision. So in this case, in the pandemic, we were able to stay open because obviously we're in open air area. Uh, we were able to keep running our markets, our CSA, and then we have a number of senior drop-off points that we've been focused on developing for the last couple of years. So we were able to continue to serve these more cut-off communities. We also launched an online program. So we'd been aggregating food and we'd been looking for a way to maybe not compete, but um, to run alongside bigger supermarkets as a way of providing these healthy foods that are coming more locally. So with higher nutrition density because they haven't traveled as far and also with a little bit of that know your farmer capacity. So all of these sorts of resources that we've been developing long-term mean that we have local resources that don't, re don't rely on these longer supply chains and more technical supply chains that were sort of disrupted in uh, the times of the crisis. And those are things that any sort of urban agricultural institution can turn on um, in moments of sort of uh, pressure on the food system. So one of the other things that was really big when we started, and for me is actually probably one of the more important roles of urban farms is the capacity for community development um, and local advocacy. So they're, incredible centers for developing not only bonding, but also bridging social cohesion. So obviously all of the people who are working together in a site learn to trust one another. Um, but because food is so central to the way that we get to know other people, they serve as really important points in the community uh, where people have easy access and low barriers to entry in developing other relationships. So you're able to develop a lot of trust really quickly uh, you're able to grow a lot of local activism because people are already coming to you for advice in general and you're able to develop uh, and foster sort of community leaders. All of those things become again very important when you're talking about a moment of crisis because you have this sort of network of not only hyper local personal relationships with community leaders but also you have this sort of deepened web of institutional relationships, whether that be with local schools, if it's with other urban agricultural institutions, and then also within the city. And then I would say the, the other thing that kind of ties to that is this idea of knowledge transfer. So when you have a deep understanding uh, of what a community looks like, of what their cultural needs are, of who's isolated, of language needs of your best ways of distributing information because you've developed those things over time. In a crisis, those are things that you can automatically turn on and it gives you a better situation at a hyper local level than a municipality might be in, not only for food provision and, and, and getting things like food aid out, but also for just the distribution of basic forms of information. Um, the sort of web of relationships that you've built is also really important because I think these spaces are super flexible and modular. A lot of the resources that we have at SWAG are shared resources, which means that we're able to turn them on when we need them, especially important in a crisis, but it also means that because we're sharing them, they're not 
they're not pulling on all of our funding throughout the year. Maybe one of the last things I would point to is how I see these spaces as important beyond just a crisis or beyond just the food provision that they're doing right now as sort of centers of regional resilience. So if we think about the need uh, to sort of strengthen our urban rural linkages and our capacity to rely more on not just a local area at a municipal level, but being able to pull from larger regions around us as opposed to from in the United States across the country, you really need to have an endpoint in these urban food hubs, but you need them to be developing relationships kind of in a spoken in node style uh, in and out of this city. And what that allows you to do is to not only bring in broader food options by aggregating things at points along the way and then having sort of a pipeline that brings it in. It also means that you can guarantee supplemental income for people in the city, because what you're saying is you're not only selling your foods, we can go after sort of the public purse and broader institutions by promising them that they will always have a flow of food, which we can guarantee by having regional partners. But it also means that we always have kind of a, a not so much a hiding place, but a way to channel urban food into that entire system. It also allows for sort of regional farmers to have more customer connections without them relying on their own time and resources. It allows them to channel into a network of relationships and trust that's already been built within the city. So they're playing off the fact that like city residents already know their urban growers, trust their urban growers or urban growing organizations. And therefore that trust can expand out again. It can, that cohesion bridges out again beyond just the hyper-local into the region. And one of the other things that it does is it allows for a lot of educational exchange. It allows us to educate city dwellers on a little bit more of uh, the capacity of regional growers, the troubles that they're up against. And then on the other end, it allows us to use regional growers to better educate our urban farmers. And I'd say the last thing that it really allows us to do is to build this larger capacity to change public policy. So one of the things we're working on in Newark right now in developing this like broader rural linkage program is going to the city and asking them, hey, if we can guarantee more hyper-local food in combination with regional food, would you be able to include provisions uh, in how public buying goes or recommendations for institutional buying that would allow us to go after 5% or 10% of that market and guarantee that market. Are we good there? Nancy? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, so we've got some really good questions coming through already, um, but what we'll do is I'll um, give the floor over to Tom now, and then we'll take our questions at the end. Okay, so please do keep the questions coming through. Um, so I'm just going to try and share the screen as well. Given that I'm doing the uh, technology segment, um, this isn't a great start. Um, it's not showing up with the presentation that I want to present, unfortunately. Let me just stop share. Present again. Okay. Zoom is never easy on these things. Okay, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, alongside uh, Sarah and Alondra. A uh, big thank you to Matt and to the LSE team for um, uh, organizing everything behind the scenes. Um, my name is Tom Henderson, uh, and I'm the Market Programme Manager for Smart Digital Twins uh, and Climate Risk and Resilience at TechUK, uh, which is the UK's trade association for the technology sector um, that looks to bring people, uh, companies and organisations together to realise the positive outcomes that digital technologies can drive. Uh, and today I want to talk uh, as plainly as I can about the, the role that digital technologies can play uh, in enabling new modes of agricultural production uh, and in supporting the delivery of human-centred, uh, resilient and inclusive outcomes. Um, so as we've heard already from uh, Alexandra there and in, uh, in Nancy's introduction, uh, food obviously plays a, a pivotal role in our lives uh, and shapes who we are 
Um, in many ways, it also reflects how far we have to go to build uh, healthy communities and, and strong societies. Uh, and the security and equity of food provision is increasingly challenged uh, by complex interconnected patterns of demographic and environmental change. Uh, and it's well known, for example, that you know, rapid population growth causes less deep droughts and soil degradation and uh, food prices uh, cropping up all around the world. Um, and not to mention that we're in the midst of a, a global pandemic as well, which has made the case for, for healthy, resilient uh, and sustainable modes of food production more compelling than ever. At the same time, we've seen uh, an increased uh, an accelerated rate of innovation and experimentation in traditional agriculture, uh, and also the emergence of radically new uh, urban alternatives such as vertical. Um, so taking vertical farming as one example of, of new modes of, of uh, urban agricultural production, uh, which in, basically entails the, the practice of stacking plants in, in tall built environments uh, under controlled conditions. Uh, we see immense opportunities to enhance levels of agricultural production, uh, whilst also saving vital resources um, such as space uh, and water. We also see enticing opportunities and prospects to dramatically reduce the need for long distance transportation, uh, to reduce our dependency on, damage, uh, on damaging pesticides, and to contribute to enhanced levels of food security, particularly in those densely populated urban areas, um, both across the UK and around the world. Uh, on its own, experts predict that vertical farming, uh, again, as an exemplar, will become uh, a £10 billion uh, market by 2026. So we see a relatively near-term near opportunity for the UK to set, to, to set an example in urban agriculture uh, that the world wants to follow by capturing a portion of this market share, but also on, uh, in terms of delivering on a wide range uh, of couple of policy objectives. Uh, and as with many forms of urban agricultural production, you know, vertical farming, again, as an exemplar, faces barriers such as high real estate values, uh, and upfront costs, uh, limited skilled human labour, um, which all have a bearing on, uh, on uh, the potential transportability uh, and durability um, of, of the model. Uh, and in this slide, I want to draw attention to some of the, uh, the interesting areas of technical innovation uh, that we're seeing arising uh, in this sphere, uh, and particularly some of the major initiatives which could de risk and accelerate the scale deployment uh, and diffusion um, of these new modes of agricultural production, uh, helping to overcome um, those barriers that we see. Um, so first and foremost, I wanted to uh, really draw attention to the UK's rapidly evolving and wildly digital twin ecosystem, um, where we've seen an explosion in the development of solutions designed to provide decision makers uh, with the information they need uh, when they need it. Um, so digital twins um, uh, are essentially dynamic virtual representations of physical objects or systems uh, that use real world data simulation uh, or machine learning to enable understanding, learning and reasoning. Um, they offer three sort of core opportunities and use cases uh, in the context of urban agriculture, uh, which I just wanted to run through and, and contextualise a little bit more. Um, so firstly, you know, strategy and planning. They can dramatically enhance the capacity of decision makers to strategize uh, and plan effectively. So, for example, city-level city digital twins could be used to support investment uh, or capital um, delivery planning or to simulate levels of adherence to the environmental policy objectives of legislative, legislative measures. Uh, and this is already, already becoming commonplace uh, in infrastructure uh, uh, and construction sectors uh, where contractors and asset owners uh, use digital twins to enable better systems level design and project delivery. So could that be applied in, in an urban planning context uh, in the context of um, urban agriculture? Um, secondly, we see a role for digital twins in managing the day-to-day -day performance uh, and availability of key assets. Uh, in the energy sector, for instance, we're seeing an uptake in digital twins to enable uh, the optimization of flexible, decentralized local energy systems. Um, so if we're thinking about you know, vertical farming, which uh, you know, requires LED lights um, uh, to replace uh, solar uh, energy, you know, could we use digital twins to build energy systems that incorporate that need for adjustable uh, levels, levels of energy uh, and that, more, that are more resilient to exogenous shocks? Um, thirdly, we know that digital twins can play a part in enhancing levels of assurance and safety uh, and resilience. Uh, again, this is already commonplace in domains such as uh, aerospace or defence, uh, where digital twins are used to demonstrate that components or systems adhere to different standards or regulatory conditions um, without the need for, for costly physical experimentation. Um, so in, a, in urban agriculture, for example, could this make, a, you know, could this make it possible for decision makers um, to prolong the life of key assets, processes or systems 
uh, and clearly demonstrate how uh, urban farming contributes to wider national level objectives. Thinking more broadly about the, the state of the UK ecosystem as well, um, just wanted to you know, draw attention to the fact that uh, the UK's ecosystem is backed up by a, a government funded national digital twin program, uh, which aims to build a national ecosystem of connected interoperable digital twins uh, across the built environment. So, you know, the, the future looks particularly bright regarding converging this area of technical innovation um, uh, uh, and different areas of innovation uh, emerging across the built environment, uh, and in particular, urban agriculture. Uh, and moreover, Tech UK, um, so uh, the company I work for, obviously, is, is currently working with the national program into uh, to feed in strategic advice uh, and examples uh, uh, and evidence on the viability of those plans that the national program are developing um, bringing in examples uh, from digital twins in domains like healthcare and um, cyber security or financial services um, and advising on areas of future convergence that should be given more attention uh, and urban agriculture is certainly one of those areas that we'll be looking at in the forward to the months ahead um, drawing on insights from our multidisciplinary cross-market um, digital twins working group um, that we have here. Beyond this, I just also wanted to, to touch on uh, the adoption of technologies in the field uh, of agriculture, um, because it also uses satellites to monitor crops, uh, radio tags on livestock, airborne thermal imaging and ground level sensors to predict and optimize yields uh, with minimal resource input, uh, you know, such as fertilizers, water uh, and pesticides. Um, we're also seeing big data modeling uh, becoming increasingly prevalent uh, as a way of predicting and monitoring pest outbreaks. Uh, and drones are enabling farmers to, to make decisions regarding land use. So uh, could this become a particularly uh, transferable uh, and significant approach? Um, or capability, uh, particularly when you consider you know, the scarcity of arable land in urban areas. Um, and those pictures at the bottom there are, are essentially uh, a case study from uh, Intel. So uh, in the example image uh, to, to the left, um, we see that Intel developed an IoT platform that helped uh, Malaysian farmers to use less water um, while simultaneously doubling their yields. Uh, and the platform essentially monitors how water is distributed to farms um, via irrigation systems and water gates uh, and helps farmers to determine the minimum amount of uh, water that's required for crops, uh, for crops uh, based on historical indicators uh, as well as predictive uh, indicators. So, you know, uh, future levels of, of water availability or the future temperature and air pressure, for example. Uh, and again, you know, could new urban initiatives take note of these practices uh, and apply them in a city context? And lastly, I just wanted to draw uh, a link between uh, you know, the future services uh, and the UK's innovation infrastructure. Um, because clearly when it comes to feeding the billions of new mouths around the world uh, and coping with these uh, long thoracic exogenous uh, emerging risks, um, we can't just automate what we already have. Um, you know, we have to come up with radically new ways of producing and delivering food to citizens. Uh, and ultimately, this will require uh, a massively parallel, massively non-linear approach. Uh, and our ability to work together to solve big problems like food scarcity or even a pandemic depends on whether we can recognise the irreversible state change that we're living through uh, and on our fidelity to, to facts, science uh, and logic uh, and not just making stuff up. Uh, and just like plants need fertile grow, uh, ground to grow, uh, new modes uh, of urban agricultural production will require well-designed, controlled innovation and ecosystems that enable researchers uh, across the public, private uh, and third sectors to experiment, uh, you know, to, to build up channels for social commentary uh, and to deliver uh, direct uh, benefits to citizens in real time. Uh, and with this in mind, um, the Smart Cities and Connected Communities group that we run here at TechUK is currently uh, exploring the different ways um, and options that the government has at its, has at its disposal uh, to strengthen innovation infrastructure and capacity across the UK. Um, so if you'd like to find out more about the work that we're doing there and the different options that we're exploring, um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, the last couple of slides, just really to call attention to the fact that we're running uh, a, a related event in this space and drawing out the case studies and examples um, uh, of the work that they're doing. Um, 
And then the final point is just around uh, a number of different strategic advisory groups, which Techie is part of, um, which are relevant, I suppose, to, to the focus of this um, particular workshop. Um, and just to give you, I guess, a sense of the, the, the full spectrum of different issues that are interrelated with uh, agriculture uh, that we see evolving in cities. Um, again, if you've got any questions for me, then uh, feel free to get in touch, and I'm sure uh, that we'll have a, a lively discussion in the Zoom uh, Q&A. Thank you very much, Tom. That's very interesting. Um, and Sarah, let me pass over to you, and then we'll... Um, after you're finished, we'll get to some questions. Great, I'll just <clears throat> attempt to share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just about to go to slideshow. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Great, okay. Okay. It sometimes asks me to sign in. So hi, everyone. I uh, hope you're uh, enjoying your lunch. I just dashed mine down. It's typical of us working in food that we don't make time for our own lunches. Um, but yeah, just to uh, introduce, uh, I thought I would cover, uh, as, as requested, some stuff around how policy can support the growth of, of the of the movement and um, I think already having listened to Tom and, and seen um, some probably quite different views on, on um, the problem statement of our food system and um, the, the idea of the movement is probably one that would need unpicking a little bit further. But basically, um, as mentioned in the introduction, I work uh, at Sustain and we're an alliance for better food and farming. So that means there's about 100 UK uh, NGOs involved um, and we basically come together over key campaign issues and to try and ch ultimately change national policy, which drives a lot of decisions that are made. Um, so, and we've been going for about 21 years. Um, Capital Growth is one of the, the projects and campaigns that we've been running. Um, and I've been there at Sustain for about the last 11 years, um, first working on it and now managing the team that do that. So we, uh, just to give you that introduction, we campaign for policy change, um, which means that we are often working at quite a strategic level. We're only a small organisation, but we're really looking at that top level national national, and also local policy that can, can really create the right framework for a better food and farming system. Um, we also demonstrate change. So sometimes people don't believe that those solutions will work. So we often work at quite a local level to demonstrate things like, for example, how you could actually actually um, procure organic within public spending. So, you know, that the budget is there and we've worked on projects where we've actually shown that that is possible. And again, I think with capital growth, we were demonstrating that, that urban agriculture is possible um, at a time when people weren't so sure um, and thought that it was a little bit crazy that you would grow food in a city. And we still get those questions. Um, really, you can grow food in the city. So. Um, we also build a lot of network, so our influence isn't just the people that we employ or, or the NGOs we work directly with, but there are lots of, I've got a kitten in the room, sorry, you might hear some meowing. Um, you might, um, is about also how we build those networks to change and how we we, we grow a, as, a, as a movement. And as I mentioned before, capital growth um, and uh, now we have the good to grow, also missed out too, the good to grow, which is our national network, which is trying to work with the sustainable food places network, which is around 50 cities um, that are setting up food partnerships between a civic society, uh, local government and, and other um, stakeholders within a, within a local area to try and change that food system. Um, <clears throat> we've done lots of different uh, work. These are old infographics, but um, that we've helped convert quite a significant amount of land um through grants and working quite closely with the gla um working really closely with the gla and we produce lots of toolkits provide lots of training and i've just put a few examples of the range on them of them there so working closely with with people on housing estates um, and housing managers reaping rewards was about how much food can be grown in cities and using our harvestometer um, and the urban farming toolkit was something we produced with growing communities who are a social enterprise um, who've been setting up urban market gardens for, for the last 15, 20 years as well. <clears throat> 
So I thought I'd just briefly unpick what urban agriculture means to us. Um, it's not a term that we actually use that often in the Capital Growth Network. Um, not, I wouldn't say it's a loaded term, but I think it has certain gravitas in, in certain circles and maybe more overseas than it does uh, in the UK context. We also find it used slightly more by academics or people studying the sector. Um, and actually, Actually, a lot of people on the ground see themselves more as part of the community food growing sector than they do urban agriculture. So when you think of urban agriculture, what image does it conjure up? Does it conjure up sort of open fields growing at scale? Does it conjure up, you know, children going at school? Does it conjure up, you know, areas at the bottom of a block of flats being converted as the pictures on the on the left hand show? And um, does it does it pick conjure up small uh, individual plots that are assigned to people, people growing at scale, or does it conjure up the images that Tom presented, which is a sort of industrialised food system, but that happens to be located in a city. So I think there's already some interesting ideas about what urban agriculture means to us. And while I'm not one to labour a definition, um, uh, I think it's really important that we understand that behind this question around what national policy can do for urban agriculture, there's a really um, loaded value statement about what we think the problem is. Um, and when I hear things like the problem is that there's not enough food to feed people in the future, uh, that's not where I'm coming from. I'm coming from where, why is our food system broken? Why is it that some people are starving and some people are obese? Why is it that some people never eat a fruit and vegetable and live their life on processed food? Why is it in the middle of a pandemic that people have to turn to food banks? So there are some of the problem statements that I suppose that we're dealing with as opposed to how do we ramp up production? How do we make more money out of food? I suppose I would like to see food used more as a public and recognised as a public good. It's something that we all need to survive uh, as opposed to um, a commodity. And I suppose, therefore, what policies I think are needed to encourage urban agriculture sit firmly in that value framework. And I think it's really important to recognise that. At the same time, it's not that I feel that tech is bad. Um, I think, I mean, it is neither good nor bad. It's a tool that can be used. And obviously, you know, all farmers use tech and, and, and need tech um, in order to maximise and, and increase production. So um, it's not not so saying that tech is, is, is in, a, in a bad camp, but just more about where the values are coming from. Um, and I suppose we've seen a growth in um, people being really interested in indoor growing. Um, within the city and um, part of our challenge to that has been where are the public goods when you're growing food in a warehouse um, as opposed to when you're growing food in, in an amazing agroecological farm that brings lots and lots of wildlife benefits can create jobs and create access to nature which during the pandemic we've seen as really interesting. Um, so just to run through the sort of national policies uh, that are around at the moment, I, mm, um, I wouldn't say there is a really strong national policy that supports the sort of urban agriculture that, that I would uh, be calling for at the moment. Um, that's of, unless, of course, that you're in Scotland um, and Scotland have uh, got now got a duty for local areas to, to write a food growing strategy as part of their Community uh, Empowerment Act. Um, so, so Scotland's up there uh, winning the race again on, on uh, one of the food issues. Um, we also have some stuff that, some work that's been led by Natural Eng England, who are the Quangos, so very much from an access to nature point of view and looking at the benefits of, of farming, but that's much less around urban agriculture per se. Um, and then there's also some stuff within our planning frameworks about food growing and how, uh, how that can be supportive of food growing. I think the thing is that in terms of food generally and uh, there and, and farming, the, the national policy isn't necessarily uh, supportive at the moment. Obviously, we're going through massive reforms around uh, once we leave the EU about how we give out farm payments and what that is and that isn't going to value. And at the moment, we're campaigning quite hard to make sure that the ELM scheme, which is the environmental land management um, subsidy, is, is also available to those that are growing in within peri-urban areas. <clears throat> Um, uh, we're also uh, obviously really excited that we're finally we're going to be having a national food strategy. Obviously, part one of that strategy is focused very much on some of the immediate needs around trade uh, and around um, access to food during the pandemic. Pandemic, and we're yet to see what part two of it 
uh, will have. But as it's got such a wide scope, I think the idea that it will go into the level of detail that we might want to see around urban agriculture is probably hopeful. Um, <clears throat> there are also many people calling on government to, to create a land use strategy, um, particularly for, for England, to see how we could get a more uh, holistic view across the UK of, of how we use our land and what that's used for. And that could um, bring up some interesting stuff that could also impact on, on urban agriculture. But I would have to say, I think at the moment, um, uh, it might be different from the business, um, from Bay's department um, in terms of seeing it as an, an opportunity for, for business and the growth of tech business. But in terms of national government, I would say that urban agriculture is probably very, very small, very tiny bit on their radar um, and, and is not something that they would necessarily ha have been looking at. But things may have changed um, during the last six months. Um, but so that would be my uh, my sort of prese of, of where we are at on national policy, which is there could there is a lot more that, that could be done to, to support urban agriculture. I, I think one of the challenges is also going back to what our vision of urban agriculture is and what it means to us is when trying to communicate that to, to policymakers at a national level, it's what, what are we doing urban agriculture for? Is it for the health benefit? Is it for the food production? You know, is it for the employment opportunities? And I think because the, the movement itself is so varied and so diverse, it's difficult to say that there's one story behind that. And I think in some ways that's the difficulty of lumping everything together under urban agriculture, uh, as opposed to being quite specific about the sort of growing that we're doing. Um, anyway, I could talk more about that, but, but I think that's some of the challenges that, that we face. Um, regionally, I think that there's something much more interesting going on at regional policy level. Um, capital growth has managed to survive three changing political leaders swinging from, you know, uh, from, from left to right, back to left again. Um, so there is definitely regional support within, within London. And we've supported by a really strong food policy team at the Greater London Authority. Um, and we've worked closely with them for a number of years and continue to do so. So they open doors and, and put urban um, agriculture and community food growing on the table where it might not have been otherwise. And have given a significant funding and policy support. And here are just a, a couple of the um, documents that community food growing has been included in. So the London Food Strategy, um, which was published, oh, I can't keep my years up, I think it was two years ago now, um, the London Environment Strategy, and recently, um, although it's not been signed off yet, the new uh, London Plan, which obviously is the Spatial Development Plan, and one of the real uh, governing documents for our city has community food growing firmly rooted in it. So I think that regionally we can see that there is, there is much more uh, work going on. The challenge with regional is what uh, what they have the mechanisms to do. So they're great influencers, but they aren't landowners. Um, and so how can they really, really uh, get get going and support in urban agriculture? Obviously, that funding support has been really valuable and they have invested um, quite a significant amount of money as part of their good growth fund, which is their local economic um, partnership fund for London. So we're seeing that they really get the economic capital opportunities of um, agroecological farms, not just industrial farms. Um, and locally, uh, again, you know, this is probably the area where we do the most work um, because uh, the needs for urban agriculture are access to land, some resources and some supportive policies. And local government can provide all of those things. Um, in fact, we've just produced a, a report called Fringe Farming in London, which is about trying to um, grow peri-urban um, food growing within the city. Um, and we've we've seen that, that local authorities own significant amounts of land, and a lot of that is agricultural land and small holdings, most of it not being used to grow food. So we know with a really small sort of impetus and policy change, we could actually significantly inc increase the amount of, of horticulture that's going on near our cities. Um, so we work with planning, parks and open spaces department, public health, and also try, trying to work now with climate change and um, the, the action plans that local authorities are starting to put together. Um, interestingly, they recognise food, but don't really know how to address it. Um, and the, the other interesting thing we're seeing is a bit of a, a conflict, uh, which we don't think needs to be there, but with some of the tree planting um, programmes that local authorities are putting in, in terms of meeting climate targets, they're just like, 
blanket planting trees um, and not really thinking about the opportunity to plant fruit and nut trees or how that might be part of a more multifunctional um, green space where you also had food production. Um, just some briefly some stuff around our response within the pandemic. So uh, we we helped uh, local gardens who were really, really desperate to just to do something. They were seeing that people were hungry for food and they were growing it. Um, so Community Harvest has been growing food for those that need it most. We had around 40 gardens grow about four tons in, in the first three months and some of those really small gardens that hadn't produced productively before. Um, so I think that there is, uh, you know, the community food growing has come into its own during this time and, and I'm, I'm uh, really impressed to see that and as a result I think we'll see it rising up the po political and the policy agenda um, and people starting to take food security and, and resilience seriously um, and all the things that Alex talked about earlier. Um, and also, um, just to mention again, our peri-urban agenda, we, uh, you know, we really believe about growing food at scale near cities. We don't believe cities will necessarily feed themselves, but we believe in a localised food system where uh, you have a sort of zonal model where your freshest food would hopefully be grown nearest to you um, and therefore not need to be refrigerated and transported miles and wasted. And as we know, it's those salad bags that always go in the bin, right? Um, uh, we know that we need a la we need land for that. We need uh, routes to market, and we need good skills. Um, and it produces resilience, loads of opportunity, and there's also an equality element to um, to growing food around cities. Um, and we're really pleased to, to announce that we've got like a new project that's looking a bit more detail at the peri urban agenda. I'll stop talking really fast now. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and Sarah, that was super interesting. Uh, we've got a number of questions that have come through. Um, so I will start with the first. Um, and this is pertaining to African countries, um, specifically um, Zambia. And the question is that in Zambia, public health regulations often um, pres prescribe against growing food crops in urban areas. So um, the person is wondering if there are some kind of contradictions here. So I, for me, it reminds me of um, things like planning regulations in the US where it was formally um, against your zoning regulations to grow food, for example, in your front garden, and you could be penalized for doing that. But now as things have changed, um, and if culture has changed, those kind of regulations have changed. Does anyone um, want to address that? I can pop in real quick. I mean, there are still a lot of places in the US, especially in uh, kind of suburbs where urban food growing in your front yard is prohibited. And I think that part of that comes from a long trajectory of concepts of what is urban dirt, what looks orderly, like our concepts of what food growing looks like, what will look nice in a city. And sometimes those concepts also come from actual pollution issues. So for example, in Newark and in New York, both places that I grow, especially in the Bronx and Harlem, most of our beds have to be raised beds. So it, there is some level of public, uh, of public city concern for soil toxins, things like that. But I think all of those are things that can be mitigated. And I think that there's just a trajectory of learning how to deal with and negotiate with city officials to understand how you can get to a point where you can grow in an urban space. And it really is, I think, uh, one part about cultural change and people's perceptions of what belongs in a city. You know, agriculture, you know, by, by what a city is and by what agriculture is, they have long been separated and that is the definition of those different spaces. And I think it's the reconceptualization that we allow to happen or we encourage to happen over time. Great. I, I think that's um, actually a really good point. Does anyone else, um, is there a kind of a role for urban technology in these kinds of issues or? Yeah, I think, I think essentially the role of technology that I would see there is, I guess, demonstrating that there is uh, valuable in, in unused space. Um, I guess when it comes to making regulations and policy, um, I, uh, I suppose decision makers have to see that there's a there's some form of tangible return um, to um, you know, allowing certain things to happen. So, you know, if you allow uh, crops to 
to, to be grown in in a city you know what's the what's the potential opportunity cost um that's uh, embedded there um you know can that can that land be used for for alternative uh thing you know can it, traditionally uh they're used as you know uh, city city spaces are, are generally used for sort of commercial activity um uh, and i guess what we need now is is some sort of re-envisioning uh, and and some sort of way to prove that you know, growing crops, crops within those uh, areas can, you know, can be feasible uh, and it can demonstrate, um, uh, you know, tangible value for those decision makers and flow back to the original investor and whether that's, um, you know, a private or a government um, investor, um, you know, if there's some way to capture that value uh, uh, and showcase um, it to, to decision making communities, then, um, you know, long term strategic buy in might be uh, slightly easier to retain. And I think this brings us in something that probably the whole panel could really comment on. And it's the second question we've had. And it's really about what kind of work urban farming should be doing. Should urban farming be part of a kind of um, a more com community balanced system of um, gardening and food production for local areas and local communities? Should it be scaled up? to actually provide something that is um, a far larger um, provision of food? Does it need to be corporatized or monetized in that way? Um, and really also um, a question of, is um, urban farming kind of a, a reaction against um, a more global agribusiness or does it need to take on some of the qualities of that in order to be successful? Yeah, maybe I would hop in and I would just push back and, you know, Sarah kind of made mention of it before. I would push back on this constant focus on the need to intensify our agricultural production and really point to the fact that a large problematic that we've been dealing with globally for a long time, especially when you think about how international and national agencies focus on things like feeding the world is the fact that we don't have a problem feeding the world. We have a problem with distribution. We have a problem with who controls access to food, who controls access to the logistics of distribution. And I would really push back against the idea that all space needs to be assessed for, you know, the opportunity cost or the absolute value that can be captured by that. I would, I would argue that that is 100% what got us to the place where we are, which is the constant marketing and commodification of food. And I'm not here to say that tech is bad. I think that there is a lot of room for tech in aiding our understanding of the capacity to grow food, how it can be better moved around, how it can be better aggregated, you know, developing. I think the focus for me is less on absolutely developing all urban spaces so that they are, you know, reaching the extent of their productive capacity. And the numbers game is our only way of evaluating what's important, continuing to evaluate what's important, as opposed to understanding that there is some form of local control. There are justice issues that are involved with urban agriculture and that focusing on those things while using tech to aid sort of the movement of food or our understanding of who has food where, you know, in the development of some of our online markets and our aggregation of food from the regional to the hyperlocal in New Jersey, we've been able to use tech really successfully to understand what farmers are going to have what when to be better able to predict where we'll, able, we'll be able to have supply meet demand. And then again, to go after that public purse. And I think that that's very helpful. The idea that somehow vertical farming is ever gonna be more than supplemental in a city uh, or that urban agriculture should ever be more than like a supplemental part of a larger regional chain is something that I would really push back on. Yeah, I mean, j just to come in there, we talk about, I think I mentioned, we talk about localized food systems rather than local food systems, um, because it doesn't make sense. You know, we, we're not going to be growing arable and field crops with, within a city. It just doesn't make sense. But what we do know is that, it, you know, in the UK, we only grow 17% of our fruit and we and we only grow about 53% of our, our veg. And we do that on 1% of our agricultural land. Now, if we really want to aspire for people to live healthier lifestyles and, 
you know, we, we're seeing the impacts of that not happening at the moment, then we and, and if we're about to leave the EU, then we really need to get serious about scaling up our horticultural production. Um, and some of that can very much happen near and around our cities. And the reason that that becomes so important is it's about engaging people in where their food comes from. Um, you know, I was on a presentation earlier and it, it shocked me every time I hear it. If food waste was a country, it would be third behind uh, the US and China in terms of climate emissions. You know, we, we, we waste just too much food. Food is too cheap. And that's a really hard thing to explain to people that haven't got enough money. To, to buy their own food so this is part of a bigger story and, and a lot of people you know uh, talk about food sovereignty and I think that this is where this sits and this is why uh, I suppose capital growth was much more about community food growing because it was about helping people to feel included in that story um, and to, to have some agency over um, where their food comes from. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to grow all their food themselves, but having having connection with the soil or knowing someone that does is, is really profound and has been even more profound during, during the pandemic. Um, and we've sort of seen sort of communities coming together. So for me, I think, you know, there's definitely a need to, um, to just reimagine what our cities could look like, what this potential could be. What if we did think about food differently? How might we empower people to think differently? Um, and, you know, yeah, there are opportunities for employment and skills and enterprise and business within all of that, you know, and I'm a, a really firm believer in, in social enterprise and, and, the, and the value of that. But I think this is about more just reimagining. But I suppose that's part of this unpicking what urban agriculture means, because as with all terms, things become hijacked. And if it, and we we get lots of, you know, Talk, people coming and wanting to talk to us about really, really high tech systems and moving these into the, to London and we know all the big supermarkets are on it. Um, uh, and it's not that that in itself is a bad thing, but where does that fit in the vision of where where our food system is going and, and hopefully um, some uh, you know, Henry Dimbleby, who's leading up the, the food policy, um, the national food strategy will be able to help create some of that vision uh, nationally that we can then feed urban agriculture into. That's really brilliant. And, and the other question that I want to kind of bring in here um, in the last moments of, as, uh, that we have is there's kind of a separate, or is there a separation between kind of global north and global south? Um, we have a researcher who has been looking at Santiago in Chile, and I believe it's a comment from the same person, um, but uh, they're talking about how um, urban farming has really and urban agriculture has been able to create a place for rural migrants in in urban areas and urban farmers to give them actually a meaningful life to give them access to income and access to services and I, I don't know if any of you have any experience between the kind of global south and global north um, division in sort of urban agriculture but I wondered if you had any comments on that yeah, I mean, a number, so a large portion of our farmers in Newark are uh, African migrants from across the continent. Our head farmer is actually from Ghana. Um, and most of the projects that I'm doing in New York involve a lot of different, either Puerto Rican, Dominican, or often Mexican immigrants. So there is a lot of that transition. I think for me, you know, that that is like in this global political diaspora sphere. I don't know that it's always just the north and the south. I think it has to do a little bit more with um, chains of development and where different countries or different regions fall in terms of development. A, in terms of looking at how urban agriculture might happen there, you know, in Ghana, where our farmer is from, urban agriculture plays a much different role because it's much more common in sort of the peri-urban parts of the city where people, almost everybody has their own, uh, I guess you would call it maybe a kitchen garden or a small plot, but then in the center of the city, almost no one has it because Accra is very, is super busy and, and the land has been deemed valuable in different ways, but also just the price of land is, is different. So I think there are a lot of different contexts. One of the things that I like to talk about in Newark as well is thinking about how no matter how well we're able to grow the farmers within our network, 
this money will always be supplemental for them. It will never, for the majority of them with the space that they have, it will never be something that they can fully live off of, but it's important to figure out how to guarantee that supplemental income and to understand how that can be a consistent um, flow of money to them. And for me, that's also why regional partnership is important there, but I guess the answer to sort of the, the differences are very real. I think that's the focus Sarah is talking about and, and that I would also say that, you know, local control is very important. It's part of a justice or food sovereignty aspect, but it's also part of dealing with on the ground conditions and understanding what's truly happening. And I think that for me is, is the more important piece of that. I would, I would definitely, uh, Tom, were you jumping in? Yeah, no, no, you, uh, yeah, no, I was, I was just going to really kind of, um, I guess, you know, maybe, uh, you know, agree with a lot of what Sarah and, and Alexandra have said, perhaps I didn't put myself across in the, in the best possible light <laughs> in my earlier comments, but I think, I think the, uh, I think what was really key to us and what we're increasingly recognising as a, as a trade association for the technology sector is that, is that in the past there has been quite a, I guess, a vacuum of interaction between the, the two, uh, you know, the technical communities and the citizens on the ground. Uh, and I think what, what we need more of is these types of conversations that, you know, gets, uh, you know, the people uh, working on kind of citizen-led initiatives together with um, technical communities could, who could, you know, enable them to, um, you know, not only just, I guess, ramp up production, but also to, you know, reskill citizens and give them you know, broader opportunities in life and, and help them to connect with other people who are you know, in influential positions that, you know, could ultimately have a bearing on the, the trajectory of their entire community. So I think, you know, as I said, as I say, you know, completely agree with uh, the, the conception of, a, of an urban farm as a sort of locus for uh, citizen interaction and, uh, and empowerment. But I think that really needs to, to be a little bit more techno technologically agnostic uh, and, you know, particularly in areas like the Global South, where, you know, low cost solutions uh, have to be found to, to be deployed at scale to, to combat the size and scale of the issues that they're facing uh, and to ultimately enable countries to, you know, uh, you know dramatically raise themselves out of poverty. Uh, I think those sort of solutions, you know, are a bit more um, uh, urgent uh, in need uh, and ultimately uh, I think that kind of strengthens the case for, for technology and I, and I hope that it hasn't come across as uh, a technical rather than a socio-technical view uh, of urban farming um, uh, throughout this uh, conversation. Yeah, I, 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 was, uh, I dropped some examples in the chat of, uh, I, I was uh, fortunate enough, it feels like a lifetime ago, to visit Japan um, last year to go and visit some of the um, urban agriculture sites on, on the edge of the on the edge of Tokyo there, which were really quite inspirational. And we were also with colleagues from North Korea um, um, and uh, from um, Jakarta. So, um, you know, there are stuff, great stuff happening uh, across the world on this level. And again, it, you know, it's interesting to see what the drivers are. And, it, you know, as I say, you know, farmers have been using tech forever. You know, there would, you know, there would no, not be farming without tech, but it's about who owns that tech. And as we can say, you know, you see with multi agricultural conglomerates, you know, I don't want to mention any name, big names that begin with M, but, you know, what happens when when big companies own, own those tech investments, you know, uh, it's not it's not necessarily the future. I think a lot of us are, are envisioning at this moment in time. And I think a lot of people in the global south are, are, are onto that as well. So um, I think that, that that's a really good thing. And there's a lot that we can learn from them around their ideas around food sovereignty as well. So that's a really, a really, good, uh, really good step forward. Yeah, and I think something really good that, that you said, Tom, and I hope it doesn't feel like we've been bullying you, because for you to know, I actually spent a number of years building um, vertical farms and, and hydroponic farms, and I do really see a, a place for them, depending on who controls them, as part of supplemental food in a city and as truly educational pieces as well. But I think they're, they're kind of to, to tag on to what Sarah was saying, there is a real importance in the way that we name things and how participation happens and who, who has control of things, because I do think that they are, especially with apps and, and um, the capacity to partner online, there is a lot of room for tech and really aiding the sorts of webs that we need to develop, intensifying 
the logistics and, and sort of the web of participants or the networks of participants uh, and really being able to balance those in ways that really serve the hyper-local, serve local populations and, and allow them to have access to more partnered resources. And that takes a lot of coordination. You know, smart agriculture is not, is, is not a bad thing. These things aren't against one another. Understanding where water is coming from and being able to look at water, pa water patterns for years or understanding what sort of what your soil is doing and understanding the microbiome through technology and understanding how not to use fertilizers or how you could use organic or compost fertilizers can all be done through technology. And I think that that's just as important in urban farms as it is in broad scale agriculture, whether that's in the global north or the global south. So I think there's a very strong place for technology in, in aid of local control and in the hands of the right people. All right, guys, I just wanted to say, I think we're right on the two o'clock mark. Um, and I know everybody is probably popping off to their next Zoom meeting because that's all we ever do anymore. Um, and Sarah, thank you for the cat. That is the best, best part of Zoom, hands down. Seeing people's houses is good, but seeing people's cats is marvelous. Um, so again, I'd really like to thank all of our panelists for coming. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Uh, to let everyone know that our next event will be on density and design perception, and it will be on the 11th of November at noon UK time. Um, we did this a little later, so Alex didn't have to wake up so early in the morning um, drinking I coffee. I really appreciate that. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and again, thanks very much, everyone, and we hope you've enjoyed the event. Bye. Bye.